All right, let's uh, sing a couple songs before Seth comes up and shares a final message with us today. If you're using your songbook, the first one's going to be 508, The Wonderful Savior. 508. Oh, mm. wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. Oh, wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my Day. We give you thanks for the beauty that we've enjoyed outside this morning, for the cool weather, the rain that recently came to us, and we pray for those blessings to continue, if it's your will. We give you thanks today, especially for the time we've had together, for the, the speakers that we've had over the weekend, uh, for the messages they brought. Give you thanks for their uh, ability 
but also their determination to uh, preach your word. Give you thanks also for the ones who've attended and the ones who attend today for the determination in our lives that we might uh, be followers of you, but also we might gain knowledge and encouragement to bring other followers to you in the future. Pray that you be with us as we continue on through this time and as we go through our week this week. Help us to remember the things that we learn during our meetings and help us to try to practice those things in our lives and improve ourselves as each day uh, goes along. Forgive us for our wrongs through our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Morning scripture reading in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. If you'd like to follow along, I'll be reading from the NIV version. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when, the, when, their eyes, when, when their eyes are on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve whole, whole, wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Seth? John? Whoever wants to come up. Um. Real quick, I know some of, some of us maybe don't like our right hand knowing what our left hand is doing, but if you helped to prepare the meal in some way today, would you stand up? Seriously, if, if you did, let us see you. They ain't standing up. They're not in here? They're still in the kitchen cleaning? Oh, man, that's why I didn't want to do this. Well, God bless them. Let's, let's give them a round of applause even though they're not here. Uh, all right. Ah. Say bye to church, eat church next year. Um, let's, uh, let's get down to brass tacks. Right now we've got our last very gifted speaker to bring us a, a message from God's word today. Seth McDowell, brother, we are so pleased uh, to have you. Um, you've been a blessing to this workshop. And your heart is evident in your preaching and your teaching from God's word and uh, brother, I'm just glad you're with us. Uh, Seth is the preacher at the Shawnee Trail Church of Christ in McKinney, Texas, and has been since 2008. Uh, before that, he spent some time in Oklahoma. Uh, we forgive him for that. Um, he served as the campus minister at OCU for a couple of years, uh, graduate of OCU, earning a bachelor's in science and Bible and ministry in 2000, and a master of arts in family and ministry in 2003. Um, he's been married to Katie since uh, 2002, and they've got three great kids they brought with them on this trip, and they've got a, they've got a good trip they're looking forward to, but brother, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Come up here and preach the word. Thank you, John. Thank you all for uh, blessing us with the opportunity to be here. Um, I hope that our presence here has been a, a little bit of as much of a blessing as you guys have been to us. And I don't say that uh, in a flippant way. I really mean it. Um, on behalf of my wife, Katie, and our kids, Macy, Charlie, and Emma, it really has been a blessing to be with you and to learn about this church and from this church. And I'm thankful for John and for Ken and for the elders, for Caleb, who... Uh, who did a great job with the, the teens, and my kids got to be a part of that. Uh, they would have had to listen to Dad preach several times. They were not excited about that. And so uh, thank you very much uh, for your encouragement and your blessing, and I know Billy and, and John feel the same way. So thank you for that. Thank you for sticking around for the last afternoon session. I go to some of these things, and I'll just admit, the last afternoon session, I'm kind of like, all right, just 
uh, you guys have fun. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head home or whatever it is. So thank you guys for sticking around. And I'm not going to waste your time. We're going to jump in and, uh, so that you can get home and, and, uh, and do whatever it is you need to do today. But, but uh, thank you for, uh, for this great weekend. Maybe you have seen uh, either a bumper sticker or a t-shirt that, that has just two words on it that I think kind of summarize a very prevalent mindset of our day. And those two words are question authority. And I think as Americans, we kind of like that idea. We, we don't really like uh, people having authority over us. And we like to buck the system, right? And, and that's just kind of who we are as Americans. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you might remember John Cougar Mellencamp sang a song that I fight authority, but authority always wins. That's how that song goes. But there's something in us that just connects to that idea. Let's stick it to the man, right? Let's fight authority. But what's interesting is that in the Bible, rather than fighting authority, we're encouraged to submit to authority. In Scripture, there are five different kinds of authority that we read about. There is divine authority. That's, of course, the, the authority of God. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There's civil authority. That means the, the governing authorities. Romans 13, 1, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. There's church authority. The Hebrew writer writes to the church and says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. And then in our final text today, out of Ephesians, verses, or chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, Paul gives us two more kinds of authority. And he talks about parental authority, and then he talks about vocational authority. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1, and there Paul instructs the Christians at Ephesus, and he teaches us, this, children, obey your parents. Let's start reading in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So, who is to obey their parents? Children. What a trick question. It's pretty easy. Now, of course, as we grow older and we eventually leave the home or we get married, that does not change the honor or respect that we're to give our parents, but it certainly does change the level of authority, right? The Bible says on four different occasions that a man shall leave his father and mother, and the King James Version says they shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So part of the growing up process is eventually you leave mom and dad. Now again, notice, at that point, we are not supposed to discard our respect or our appreciation for our parents, especially if they strive to raise us to live a Christian life and they taught us God's word. God says we are to honor our parents. But the level of authority changes as a child becomes an adult. The expectation of honor does not. But here's the deal, and I'm going to speak to, to our younger crowd this morning, whoever may be here, if you're living under the roof of your parents and your parents are responsible for you, God says you need to play by their rules. You need to live by their expectations as long as those expectations are honoring of Christ. Paul says, children, obey your parents. Now, kids, when are we to obey? Well, the Bible says always with one exception. That is that if you're asked to do something that goes against the word of God or the will of God, if you're asked to be supportive of something that doesn't honor God or to say something that you know is wrong, Paul says don't do it. God doesn't want you to do anything for anyone that is contrary to Christian behavior. And that's why Paul in this passage includes a qualifier with this command. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's the qualifier, in the Lord. And the reason it's there is because God, in his infinite wisdom, knew that there would be parents who would be ungodly, who wouldn't raise their kids with spiritual values, and at times, 
even Christian parents would ask their kids to do something that's against God's will. And so young people, if your parents ask you to lie to protect them, if they encourage you to compromise your morals, if they ask you to do anything that's against God's will, don't participate in that. You can go to a higher authority. And let me just say also, some of you who are adults, you might still be in, in some form of bondage to your parents because of things that don't really fit into that category of in the Lord. Maybe your parents are manipulative. In a sense, they've, they've held you hostage to their parental authority. And as you've grown up, maybe even at the expense of your own family. And so let me encourage you to make sure that when your parents ask you to do something, you make sure that it aligns with the spirit of Christ and be clear of whether or not you're doing it out of guilt or out of gratitude. Am I doing this out of some twisted sense of, of duty for my parents or am I doing it out of love and devotion? But again, for you young people who are still living at home, make sure you obey your parents all the time whenever it's in the Lord. And, and let me just, just say this as well. If, if it ever gets to that point where, where you feel I need to take a stand because my parents are asking me to do something that, that would be disobedient to God, let me just make this clear. That only means something that only carries any kind of weight at all if you have been submissive and obedient to them up to that point. Because if you've never obeyed, then you don't have any credibility to take a stand for Jesus. So Paul says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. In other words, it is God's will for you to obey your parents. And so let me again give a challenge to our kids and to our teenagers who are here this afternoon. I want you to notice Paul doesn't say children obey your parents as long as they're perfect. We're going to talk about expectations of parents in just a minute. But it doesn't say remind your parents of all the times they've blown it. Paul makes no exceptions for parents who struggle with the role of leadership or being a mom or a dad or or who don't do things that or, or who do things that you don't like. Paul just says, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And here's the deal. Young people, you probably know this already. The world around you will most certainly rebel against authority. And your friends and your peers, they are going to ridicule adults and their parents and maybe even your parents. And the government might try to take away some of your parents' authority. But if you are a Christian, and if you are trying to have the attitude of Christ, then you will be submissive and respectful to your parents. You may not agree with every decision that they make, and you may not like some of their rules or ideas, but you should trust that they are trying to raise you in the Lord the very best way that they know how. And can I just tell you, from, from 17 years of experience as a parent, it ain't easy. They're just trying to figure it out as they go. So give them some grace. Don't take advantage of them. Don't see it as your calling to make your parents' life miserable. Instead, choose to be a Christian that's distinctive from the world, that is like Jesus. Remember, Luke 2.51 says that Jesus was obedient to his parents. And he is our example. Now, let's look at verse 4. Kids, you can take a break for a moment. Because in verse 4, there's a challenge that's given to parents. And specifically to fathers. Paul says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The King James Version says, doesn't say exasperate. It says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Now, I realize, parents, that it seems like just about anything can provoke your child to wrath at times. So let me give you a couple of ways that this can happen that I think is in the manner that Paul is talking about. So how can a parent exasperate their children? Here's the first way, and that is you act one way at church and another way at home. Parents, if you choose to live by a double standard, 
your child will choose the easier of the two. And nobody is saying that parents are to be perfect because none of us are. But we do need to realize that inconsistency and hypocrisy stands out to young people. And I'll tell you, as a parent, there have been times when I have been inconsistent, and there have been times when I have been hypocritical. There are times when I've lost my cool with my kids, and I've lost my temper, and I've screamed, and I've yelled, and I know that that has caused me to lose influence. How can I call them to be self-controlled when I can't? I must seek to live up to the same standard that I call them to. And when I miss, I need to apologize. And I need to ask for forgiveness. There's a, a new celebrity that I've kind of seen a little bit here and there. I don't really keep up with celebrities that much. And I don't even really know how to say her name. I think it's Lords Leon. I think might be the right way to, to say that. And I don't really know anything about this person except two things. She wants to be a singer... And she is Madonna's daughter. And now what's interesting is 25 years ago when Lourdes was a baby, Madonna did an interview with Vogue magazine in which she said, I want to raise my daughter to have a strong moral compass. In the article, it said, though Madonna cultivates the image of kinky sex, she wants none of that for her daughter. She admits she doesn't want her children to even see her book entitled Sex. And she promises to be a tough mom. Now here's the deal. Madonna's daughter appears to have turned out exactly like Madonna. Now, don't get me wrong. Parents, we can do a lot of things right and our, our children can still turn out differently than we hope. But for the most part, the proof is in the pudding. And regardless of what a parent may say, if their lifestyle doesn't match with what they say, if there's no consistency or there's no change of behavior, then really it doesn't matter whether you talk about having a strong moral compass or not. And so parents, we need consistency between what we say and how we live. There's another way that you can exasperate your children, and that is to never discipline the threatening parent who is not willing to discipline their children is going to continue to face frustration day after day and week after week and month after month. And so don't think, well, it's just a phase that they're going through because if you allow your children to disobey, they're going to continue to disobey. And why on earth would they change if they only hear empty threats and never have to face the consequences of their actions? I'll bet you, like me, have been in the grocery store and you've seen that little kid that's just completely disobedient, that's just running wild, and there's the mom there, and the mom is going, Brexton, stop. Brexton, I'm telling you, stop. Brexton, I'm going to count to three. That's what kills me. I'm going to count to three. Brexton, one, two, two and a half, right? And you're going to three! Say three, right? Brexton, I'm, I mean it this time, right? And it's threat after threat after threat, but there is absolutely nothing behind it. Listen, it is so much better to remind your children that God has put me in charge of you, and you are going to do, or I am going to do my very best to raise you in a way that pleases God and helps prepare you for adulthood. And you teach your children that you, they are expected to respect you and to honor you. And they are expected to obey you the very first time you ask. And if they don't obey the first time, then there are immediate consequences for their behavior. And again, trust me, as a parent, there have been times in, in our life that we've been good at that. And there have been times when we've been terrible at it. We may be in one of those times right now. I don't know. But it's hard. It takes work and tenacity and patience. But anything less than obeying the first time is not obeying. Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, Whenever a sentence for a crime is not carried out swiftly, the human mind becomes determined to commit evil. 
Proverbs 23, 13 says, do not withhold discipline from children. And so the consistency has to be there, both in the way you live and in the way you discipline. And Billy mentioned this last night, so let me just throw it in. Grandparents, you can help with this. I know the job of a grandparent is to spoil the grandchildren. Or at least that's what the, the stickers and the bumper stickers and the little signs in the kitchen say. That's not what God says. If your kids are striving to raise your grandkids in a godly manner, help them do that. Carry out the discipline that your kids want carried out with your grandkids. Help them become godly adults. There's a third way that you can exasperate your children, and that is that you show no spiritual leadership at home. Fathers, you want to exasperate your kids, you want to provoke them to wrath, then just leave the Lord out of the picture. Dr. James Dobson, a child psychologist and family expert, says to parents that there are two absolute truths that every child must know. And the first is that you love them unconditionally. And the second is they must obey you. But then he adds, those two truths, as your child grows, must be transferred over to God. That they must know that God loves them unconditionally and that God expects them to obey him. And that's so true. And parents, as an authority figure, we are giving our kids an, an, an impression of what God is like. And if love and obedience are not taught when they're younger, then it's much more difficult as they grow older to try to, try to grasp that as, as we transfer that over to God. And again, we make an awful lot of mistakes as parents, right? I expected an amen from at least my kids there. Because I have, and I do, and, and I sometimes have to apologize to my kids, and sometimes I don't when I should, and I, I need to make changes, and I, I need to seek to be better, not just in how I parent, but in how I live. But Paul says, I've also got to talk to them and teach them about God. Because this, is, this isn't just something they can hear about at church from Caleb. It needs to be an everyday part of their life. It needs to be part of what it means to grow up in your home. And again, that's hard. And it takes patience and work and tenacity and awkward conversations and all of those things. But God says in Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7, these commands I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. That's why Paul said in verse 4, fathers do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And so we need to identify the spiritual mission of our family, and we need to be passionate about guarding and pursuing that mission. And Paul identifies fathers here specifically for some reason, and I don't think that means that the dads have to do all the teaching or all the praying or, or all the leading of the spiritual conversations. In fact, I would say men, we ought to be pretty quick to invite and encourage our wives into, our, into the process because we understand that our wives are deeply spiritual and they have wonderful spiritual gifts and wonderful spiritual insights that will bless our family. But men, do not leave it to your wife to make sure the family is engaged in spiritual things. Men and women, dad and mom, identify the spiritual mission of your family and then be passionate about guarding and pursuing it. Say what James said to the Israelites just before he was about to die. He said, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors that they served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But for me and for my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, it doesn't matter what everybody else does. I'm going to make sure that my family serves the Lord. And so young people, you can tune back in. Trust your parents. Especially when they are trying to bring you up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. They're not going to be perfect. 
And when they discipline you, you're not going to like it. But don't second guess every decision that they make. Obey them and respect them because you will never know how much they love you until you have children of your own. And also because God says this is a command that comes with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. All right, Paul switches gear. In Ephesians chapter 6, he goes on to discuss another authority which deserves our respect, and it is employees obey your employer. Employees obey your employer. Look with me at verses 5 through 8. Slaves, obey your earthly master with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one of you for whatever good you do, whether you are a slave or free. Now, you may hear that and think, well, wait a minute, why did you call this point employees obey your employers? That's, this is slaves and masters. And I guess depending how you feel about your job, you might feel, well, that's a very fitting <laughs> comparison. But I think it's important for our understanding to note that slavery back then was quite different than, than the slavery we're familiar with in our country. Uh, now, it was never uh, God's ideal and there were certainly abuses that happened within the system. But, but in the first century and in, in that part of, of history, uh, slavery wasn't based on race or hatred for a certain kind of people. In fact, there were some slaves in the first century who found slavery to be better than the life that they had before. And so many people sold themselves into slavery, either to, to pay back debt or just to get out of the terrible life that they were in. There were not that many. When we talk about slaves, it's, it's said that in, in, in Rome, in the Roman civilization, uh, that probably one out of every two people was a servant or slave to somebody else. I mean, this was very common. Um, but it didn't have to do with uh, somebody being taken against their will, uh, being captured. For the most part, it, it wasn't like that. In many cases... It was possible for that person to gain their freedom from slavery. In fact, the Bible says, if you can do that, you should. That that's a good thing. So I think there is a really valid application for us in today's work environment out of this passage. Because really, if a slave was to be in submission to his master, how much more when we work out of our own free will and we receive a paycheck for what we do, should our attitude bring honor and glory to Jesus? So, how do we serve our boss? Paul gives us a couple of ways. He says, first, respectfully. Respectfully. Listen, you may not agree with their lifestyle. You might not respect their principles. But you must respect their position. Because you work for them. They pay you. And through your attitude of respect and teamwork, you can influence them for Jesus. And so that means how we talk to them and how we talk about them needs to be in a respectful manner. Maybe you've heard the story about the, the woman who worked behind the counter at McDonald's and, and, and a big six foot eight Texan with a giant belt buckle and a big old hat comes in and he bangs his fist on the counter and he says, I want half a Big Mac. She says, excuse me? And he says, I want half a Big Mac. She's kind of confused, and she says, okay, uh, would you wait just a moment, sir? And then she walks down the counter to where her manager is, but she doesn't know that the big Texan walks right down the counter with her, and he's right behind her. And she gets to her boss, her manager, and, and she says, there is this idiot down there, this big old goofball, dumber than an ox, trying to order half a Big Mac. And then she looks back and she sees he's standing right behind her. And she says, and uh, this gentleman would like the other half. <laughs> I 
Listen, if you talk behind somebody's back, especially your employer, it's going to come back to you. So Paul says you need to act respectfully. He also says fearfully. Now, that's not trembling and terror, but it's an acknowledgement that they're in charge. So you treat them as such. You don't ridicule them or undermine their authority. Realize that in that particular setting, you're the servant and they're the master. And while your input, as wonderful as it may be, may or may not be of interest to them, they're the ones who have been entrusted with making the decisions. And you don't have to work there. And so long as you choose to work there, treat them as they should be treated. A third way that Paul says is sincerely. Sincerely. Now, I am, I am blessed to work at a great church in Texas. I'm so thankful to God for placing me in that kind of work environment. I work with people who, who share a good work ethic, who are committed to biblical principles, who love working for Jesus, and I'm thankful every single day for that opportunity. But I also understand that it's unlikely many of you have been afforded that same luxury. In fact, some of you probably work for individuals who are unreal in their expectations, who are unfair in their treatment of you. They might even mock your faith and ridicule your beliefs. And I am sure that it is difficult to serve with sincerity. And yet the challenge is to try to separate your work from working for an unrealistic, unfair, ungodly master to see that what you are doing is working for the Lord. That this is something that I'm doing for God, and I'm doing it for the benefit of people that God loves. And so I'm going to work sincerely for God. The fourth characteristic is willingly. Every employer is looking for workers who are willing to do a little extra, right? I've never seen a want ad that said, wanted, a mediocre worker who just wants to get by. That's why I like how Eugene Peterson has paraphrased verses 5 and 6 of Ephesians 6 in the message. Listen to how he puts it. He says, servants respectfully obey your earthly masters, but always with an eye to obeying the real master Christ. Don't just do what you have to do to get by, but work heartily as Christ's servants doing what God wants you to do. And work with a smile on your face. Always keeping in mind that no matter who happens to be giving the orders, you're really serving God. Good work will get you good pay from the master, capital M, regardless of whether you are slave or free. The fifth characteristic is serve wholeheartedly. And that means joyfully. Not brooding or complaining, but viewing your job as an opportunity to meet needs for others and to influence them for Jesus. I like how Paul puts it to Titus in Titus 2, 9 and 10. He says, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted. Now, why? Why is this important? Here's what Paul says. So that in every way, they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. You see, through your respect and your sincerity and your wholehearted willingness to serve, you can enhance people's opinion of Jesus and of this church. People can look at you and they can say, man, there's something different. There's something distinctive about that person. I heard of a, of a, a worker who invited his boss to come to church. And uh, when the boss came, he walked in. There's a big church and a big lobby and... He wasn't really sure where to go, and so a greeter greeted him and started showing him around. And at one point during that conversation, the greeter said, well, what, what brings you here today? And the guy said, well, one of my employees invited me. And then he saw him. He said, it's, it's him right over there. And then the man said, if all my workers were like him, I wouldn't have any problems at work. That's the kind of workers we need to be. And then Paul says in verse 8, listen, if you'll, if you'll obey your employer, he says there's benefits that come with it. He says you'll win favor in your boss's eyes. Your boss will like you, right? Your boss will feel that way about you. 
But he also says, you'll receive a reward from the Lord. All right, very, very quickly. We are three minutes from being done. Not Billy three minutes, Seth three minutes. Very quickly, this passage wraps up with one final challenge to those who are in authority. To those of us who may have people working beneath us. In verse 9, he says this, Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. So listen, if you're a boss, or if you have folks that answer to you, be fair. Be realistic in your expectations. Be generous. And remember the big picture. Remember that you have a master too. And someday you will give an account to him. You see, life isn't divided up like a newspaper. Does, it, does anybody read the newspaper anymore? I don't even know if, if they have newspapers anymore. But you remember in the newspaper that it was always divided up, right? You had the business section, you had the arts and leisure section, you had the, the family section, and you had the religion section. Well, life isn't like that. Every part of our lives is to be a spiritual expression of our faith in Jesus Christ. And God evaluates your performance at work as part of your witness and your worship to him. So listen, respecting authority isn't easy. Whether it's a child obeying his parents or a worker obeying her boss, but seeing both of those responsibilities as a form of honoring a higher authority prepares us for the privilege of accepting the authority of Jesus in our daily lives. And isn't that what this whole weekend has been about? What Ephesians is about, the position and power that is ours if we will accept the person of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And here's the thing that Jesus demands. He cannot be your Savior unless he is also your Lord. So let me close with Paul's final words from Ephesians as my blessing to you. Peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying. standing. I think they're saying number 948 <clears throat> as we close. 948, I am resolved. <clears throat> I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. <clears throat> things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Be seated, please. Y'all be seated. Just one second. We're almost done. Thank you so much, Seth. God bless you, brother. That was a that was a fantastic message. All of our speakers have really blessed. Uh, we've been blessed. We've been very well fed, haven't we? 
And so I just want to say thanks, especially to all of you who helped set up and tear down tables and chairs, and uh, again, our cooking crew who, who, who went back there and, and fearlessly and, and as, as, as fast as they could tried to make a meal for everybody. I appreciate you guys very much. Um, all of you who attended, thank you for being here. Uh, it's been a blessing, and uh, love you guys. Um, so before we dismiss, there's just one little last matter. Um, next year, September 22nd through 24th, Equip 2023, our beginning with God, a journey through Exodus, or Genesis, Genesis. <laughs> Threw a curveball, didn't I? Genesis 1, verses 1 through 4 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. and The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness. And you know, as you read through the Bible, one could say that God's been doing that ever since, hasn't he? Separating the light from the darkness, uh, showing us how to live, uh, where to go, and how to be. We learn from the very opening of Genesis that unlike the other ancient world religions, pretty much all of them, our God had nobody to compete with. And he alone created all of this. Actually, he working as three persons. In fact, in the Hebrew, it's a, it's a singular being working plurally to create everything. This is something the world could learn a lot today. Uh, one theme after another in Genesis establishes God's desire to save humankind, to redeem us from the fall. We learn a lot about how we're supposed to live today by you know, considering some of those early stories and how they lived. I mean, we, we teach our kids about it in VBS, don't we? And theme after theme and a character after character in the scripture of Genesis is, is called upon throughout the rest of the Bible as examples of godliness and, and what God has done. And we live our lives based on what we believe about where we came from. So much of this is so important to us. Join us next year as we go through Genesis and learn about our beginning with God. Right now, I'm going to dismiss us in a prayer, and then we're going to be gone, I guess done for the night. Um, it's been a good weekend. God bless you guys. Y'all been here all day. And so let's go to the Father in prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Our most holy and gracious Father, our most wonderful creator and caregiver of our souls, how holy and revered is your name in all the earth. We come before you right now humbling ourselves and recognizing and confessing to you our struggles with sin, thankful and grateful that you see us as your children washed in the blood of the Lamb. We praise you for allowing us the opportunity to experience this time of reflection in the book of your servant Paul. We pray your blessings on us as we leave this place. We pray that our hearts will be called to, to share your love with others and that we will love others just as you have loved us. Indeed, we pray that our hearts will be open to your calling. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may let you do your good work in us. God, we relinquish ourselves to you. We pray for our speakers, for Seth and John and, and Billy, and we thank you, God, for the blessing that they've been. I pray for their ministries and their families. I pray for safe travels, Father, where they're going. And God, we just thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Father, for those in this body who labored so intensively to help with this workshop. You are a good God and we stand in awe of your glory. We're so appreciative of what you've done for us in Christ, and it is in his holy name that we pray. Amen. We're dismissed. <laughs>